So what I want you to realize is this, the most spiritual thing that you and I could ever participate in every single day are the choices that we make. Making a choice is the holiest activity you could participate in every single day. Many years ago, Lisa made the choice to step up and lead the small group's ministry. Many years ago. Now, I know leading a small group's ministry is spiritual, but she had to make that choice. If you woke up this morning and you decided to pray before you came to church, you made the choice to pray. If you woke up and you didn't choose to pray, that's also a result of a choice. And so what kind of choices are you making today? How are you choosing? Are you making good choices that feed the depth of your soul? I find that when choices grow, when they become more important and the stakes are high and you realize that there might be consequences to some of the choices that you make, a lot of us, we'd rather not make it. We'd rather not make choices because they're just too important. They make us feel uncomfortable. And we think that when we decide not to make a choice, that's the way to go. If you decide not to choose, you've already made a choice. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so today, as we go into this passage, I want you to pay special attention to that because I too struggle to choose many times. I still remember when I dated Jenny for about six and a half years. I was in my early 20s. We talked about marriage. I said, yeah, I'd like to marry you. But I was so scared to propose. I wasn't sure. She was my very first girlfriend. I didn't know what else was out there. I was like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know if you're the one. I, I think you're the one, but I'm not sure. I, mean, I was just so confused. I didn't know. I was too scared to choose. Six and a half years. So my father-in-law invites me to the house, and he says, what are you going to do with my daughter? What are your plans? He said, basically what he's saying is, Peter, you got to choose. And I just looked at him in the eye, and I said, uh, sir, I want to marry her. And he said, good. You have my blessings. Hurry up and get married. And six months later, we got married. It took him to push me to make the choice. And outside of giving my life to Jesus, which is the greatest choice I've ever made in my life. Proposing to Jenny and asking her to be my wife was the second greatest choice I ever made. We've been married for, yesterday we celebrated our 22nd year of marriage. It's been a long time. Yes, thank you, thank you. 22 years of being married, and uh, it's been an adventure, hasn't it, honey? We have gone through our ups and downs, and we've traveled all over the world, done ministry all over the world. I mean, when I think about the two two decades of life together, it truly is amazing, but I love it more today than I did back then. And that's only because of God. It's not because I I have this amazing ability to love. God loves her a lot more than I do. And there were so many days If you add them all up, maybe there'll be multiple years where I just said, God, I don't love her. So I need you to give me the love you have for her. And he's always has. And it's been an amazing two decades of marriage, and I'm so grateful, grateful for that. Hey, little man. You okay? (laughs) Say hi to everyone. It's a, there you go. It's all good. It's all good. Thank you, Pastor Shirley. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think you want to celebrate in person on stage with me and my wife. All right. It'll happen to you one day, I promise you, little man. Promise you. Yeah. So, listen. So, it's the choices that we make. And so, today, Jesus is going to present us with two choices. Like these two kids, they're brothers, all right? Jesus is going to give us a challenge. And the challenge is, will we make a choice? There are two key choices he wants us to make today. And we have to be willing to make those choices. There's no way of getting out of these choices because if you decide not to choose, you've already made your choice, all right? And what we've been focusing on, and as we conclude this series on the moral of the story, we've been looking at Matthew chapter 13. In this chapter, basically, Jesus goes deep into it and he helps us to understand that if we want to be citizens of the kingdom, we have to make a choice. And if you make a choice today, You have a choice to either live into that citizenship or not. And so what are the two choices that Jesus wants us to to make today? Turn with me to Matthew 13. We'll look at verses 47 to 52. Matthew 13, verses 47 to 52. I'm going to read from the NIV translation. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. 
When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in the baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked the disciples. Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. God, this text is not easy. It's hard. And sometimes we would love to just focus on texts that kind of give us this kumbaya kind of emotions. But Lord, you've taught some really hard truths in this passage today. And so God, I pray that you'll just help us to get there, understand exactly what you meant through it. So God, that we can make the choices that you want us to make today. So I pray that the words that come out of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts in this room, I pray that it would indeed be pleasing unto you. And it's in your name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 This parable is similar to the parable that Pastor Sunita preached a few weeks ago about the parable of the wheat and the weeds. Remember that? Right, the wheat and the reeds. And so when this parable, we've, this is a, a, a teaching which Jesus gives to us where he wants you to make a choice. And the first choice that he wants you to make is this. Will you choose Jesus to be your helper or king? It's the first choice you gotta make. Will you choose Jesus to be your helper or king? That's, a, that's an important, critical question that we have to ask ourselves, particularly as we look at the story in Matthew. Look at verse 47 again. Once again, the kingdom, underline that word kingdom if you have your Bible. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down in the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in the basket, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angel will come and and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now the net represents, the net and the diversity of the fish that was caught, what it represents is this powerful truth that the gospel is for everyone. It's not just for a select group of people. Now, that was important for the audience, the the disciples, but also the audience in which Matthew is writing to because he wrote to a very high Jewish audience. And for Jewish people, they believe they're God's chosen people, that, that the message of God and the things in which the Jewish faith is comprised of is only for the Jews. And so when Jesus says this, he wants them to realize that my truth isn't just for you guys and the Jews. It's for everybody. And that's the, the, the image of why there's such a diversity of the fish that were caught. All right? Matthew's favorite theme in the gospel is this theme where Jesus will judge the unrighteous. That's his favorite theme. He talks about that when you read literally from Matthew 1 through the very last chapter of Matthew. It's a, famous, a, a, a favorite theme of his where Jesus will, will literally judge the unrighteous. And some of you are kind of saying, why would Jesus do that? Why would God judge us? Because he's God. That's why. See, a lot of us, when we read passages like this, we kind of wonder and we say, God, why would you do that? Would you just think about life here today? Think about our society. Where do you think our life would be or where we would be today if there weren't any judges to enforce the law? Could you imagine where, what kind of anarchy we'd be living in right now? Could you imagine like the fear that you and I would have to even leave our house, leave our home because of the anarchy that might come out? There, we, there needs to be a judge to maintain order. There needs to be a judge to uphold the law. There needs to be consequences to people's actions, particularly if it's going to hurt themselves and hurt other people. And that's why judges are needed in society. You don't think there needs to be a judge in the kingdom of God? God is our judge. And it says here very clearly that there will be a time where the angels will come and they will judge the righteous from the unrighteous. And where did the unrighteous go? Let's just talk about it because we need to. Where do they go? Hell. Hell. If you believe in Jesus today, if you believe in Jesus, you believe in heaven. If you believe in heaven, you got to believe in hell. Hell is a real place. We're going to talk a little bit about hell a little bit later. But why does God judge us? Because he needs to vindicate himself and vindicate the righteous that have chosen to live according to the truths that he lays out for us that we find in the Bible. 
It's an important thing. And so when you think about Jesus, the choice that he wants you to make, the first choice is this. Do you see him as, your, as, as a helper to you or do you see him as your king? This is key. Now, I think a lot of us, we see him as our helper and that's a problem. You see, I'm not saying that God doesn't want to help you. Of course he wants to help you. But if you just see him as your helper, think about how you pray to him. Is your prayers just about God, help me, help me, help me. I mean, Jesus prayed to God that he would help him at Gethsemane. He said, God, help me. I don't want to do this. Let the cup pass for me. But how did he end it? Not my will be done. Let your will be done. Amen. See, he acknowledged the royal status of who God is. And it's the same way with us. I'm not saying you can't go to God and say, God, I need you to help me. Jesus, I need you to help me. But at the end, you got to say, but not my will be done. May your will be done. Amen. That's critical here. Because if we don't do that, then what is this relation between us and Jesus when we see him only as our helper? You know what it is? We become the king, and he becomes our helper. That's it. If you pray in such a way where you're always asking God to help you, you're asking Jesus to help you, basically he's become one of your servants, and you've become the king. And maybe that's one of the reasons why God can't answer your prayer request, because Jesus is your king. He's not just your helper. It's very difficult for us to understand this language because we live in a democracy. And in a democracy, we don't have any kings in this country, right? And so because of that, we, we believe our president, we believe our local officials are all here to what? To help us. Yes, you can see the president of the United States as our helper, yes. But if you live in a monarchy, you can't do that. Scott and Christina Kwok, they're missionaries to Thailand. Scott was a former staff member and a member of our church. They were here about three weeks ago. Remember, they came up on stage. Yep, there they are. And, uh, and they live in Thailand. Thailand is not a democracy. It's a monarchy. I don't know if you guys know that. There is a king. And if you disobey the king, there are severe consequences. But what's happening, what they're telling us, our elders met up with them after church, and we had a cup of coffee. And what they were saying is that these young Thai millennials are different. They're defying the king. They are literally demonstrating and saying, listen, we don't care what's going to happen to us anymore because our life is horrible. You need to change things to this country so that our lives have a purpose and a future. Do you know what's happening to them? A lot of them that are getting caught by the authorities, they're facing life in prison. There's no trial because with a king, there is no trial. You can't defend yourself. And these young people are willing to literally put themselves in prison their entire life. They're saying, we don't care. We don't really have a life. So we'll go to prison for our entire life. We want you to change. And the king is catching them and putting them in jail. That's the picture that I want you to see because that's what's going to happen to us on the day of judgment. That there's going to come a time where Jesus is going to come with his angels and they're going to they're going to take the righteous and they're going to separate from the unrighteous. And guess where the unrighteous will go? They will go to hell. They're going to go to hell. Let's talk about hell a little bit. Hell is a real place. What is hell like? Jesus says hell is a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever thought about what that meant? I was talking to a veteran many years ago, and he said this to me. He goes, Peter, you know, it's easy for people in this country to say they believe in God or they don't believe in God. It's okay to be a part of a pluralistic society. And everyone says, yeah, I believe in God. And there's a lot of people in America that today, they say they don't believe in God. But he said this to me. He said, Peter, on the battlefield, there are no atheists. Everyone believes in God because they know their lives are at stake. When I was on the battlefield, I did not meet one soldier that said they didn't believe in God. They all prayed before they went on the battlefield. Hell is a place where you go on a battlefield and there is no God. There is no hope. Think about the worst day of your life and times that by a couple thousand. Weeping and gnashing of teeth happens because every day of your life will be a day in hell where there is no God. There is an absence of God. That is hell. That is hell. And so how do we make Jesus our king? How do we make the choice to make Jesus our king? It's not a verbal affirmation. It requires a lot more than that. We've learned that over the last couple of weeks. How do you say to Jesus, Jesus, I choose you as my king today? This is what it is. You have to be willing to live out the truths that Jesus teaches us. You have to will be willing to commit yourself to obeying Jesus Christ. Amen. 
You have to be willing to look at the Bible, particularly the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. If you want to know what it means to obey Jesus, read Matthew 5 through 7 because he taught it and it is what you have to do. Matthew 5 through 7, read what he says that we have to do. And knowing that this isn't just Jesus, our friend, telling us this, this is Jesus, our king. Amen. We are part of a monarchy. There are no options here. Jesus says, as your king, you must do these things. Why? Not so that Jesus can accept you because he's already accepted you. Because our king, guess what he did? He died for us on the cross and resurrected from the dead. So why does Jesus want you to obey his commands? Why? You think it's so that, you know, it can kind of feed his ego and it could affirm his kingship? Does he want you to obey his commands so that he could feel better about himself as king of the universe? No, it's silly. Why does he want you to live this out so that these truths that you live out as you obey them, you can live under the power of it? It's so that you could begin to develop an intimate relationship with your king. That's it. Why does God want you to obey him? It's not so you can affirm that he's the creator of the world and he's God. He wants you to obey him because it leads to you living under the power of the truth that Jesus is telling us to live. And then when that happens, you have an intimate relationship with God. You have a relationship with God where you and God will be close, where you'll be able to connect with him. And your life, even though sometimes it might be filled with some hopelessness, Jesus will breathe life into it. That's what it means. That's why God wants you to obey. Sometimes in the church, we teach obedience is like, if you don't do this, you're a terrible Christian. Yes, in nature you are. Like when you look at it, technically you are. But the reality is God wants you to obey him so that you can get to know the depth of who he is, so that you can know the height and depth and width of his love for you and for me. But we'll never know that unless you see Jesus as your king. Because if you just see him as your helper, you're the king, and you want Jesus to do things for you. And when he doesn't do things for you, what happens? You get angry. You walk away. You struggle with your faith in Jesus Christ. It just it happens naturally. And usually the results of that is then you live in a very deep pattern of disobedience to Jesus. Jesus can never be your king that way. Now, I'm not saying that you have to obey him perfectly because we can't. We're broken people. And that's why Jesus offers us a way to repent, to confess our sins to him. But you got to make a choice today. Is Jesus your king or is he your helper? Because if he's just your helper, he can't do much for you. But if he's your king, get ready. Because our king doesn't ever make a bad decision. He always helps. He blesses and he strengthens. And he's challenging the disciples. He's saying, am I your king or am I just your helper? Jesus didn't die for you on the cross and resurrect from the dead so that he could be your servant. No, he didn't do that. He did it so that he can be your king. And you can know the power of what it means to live under the authority of that king. Dallas Willard, a very famous spiritual theologian who has passed away, he wrote this in one of his books. Do we have the quote? Here we go. No, do we? I don't know if we do. But if we don't, it's okay. He says this, wanting God to be God is very different from wanting God to help me. Wanting God to be God is very different from wanting God to help me. When you want God to be God of your life, it's very different from you wanting God to help you. So what will you choose today? Will you choose a God and let him be God, Jesus as your king, or will you just choose him as your helper? Matthew 7, 21, here Jesus gives us a warning, and this is an important warning that you and I need to know. Matthew 7, 21, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That means if you just say you believe in Jesus, Jesus says you better be careful. Because what did he say? He says, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Heaven and hell is a real place. And it's a place where either you and I will all go to. We're either going to go to heaven or we're either going to go to hell. That's the teaching here today. And not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to go to heaven. It's the ones who see Jesus as their king. And they submit themselves and surrender themselves to the king. And they do their best to live out the truths in which he teaches us. Then you'll know how you can have victory over these deep, dark, sinful things that often destroys our lives and the lives of other people. All right, so that's the first choice. Will you choose Jesus to be your king or will you choose Jesus to be your helper? Second choice that we have to make is this. Will you choose to make disciples or not? Will you choose to make disciples or not? It doesn't get any easier here, all right? When you choose Jesus as your king, I really believe you'll know the importance of this passage. You'll know the importance of taking that step of wanting to, be a, a, wanting to make disciples. When you choose him to be your helper, 
it's not even on your radar. You don't even care about, being a, about making disciples. You care more about being a disciple, but in order to be a disciple, you got to make disciples. Look at what Jesus says in verse 51. He says, have you understood all these things? Jesus asked his disciples. Yes, they replied. Then he said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out his storeroom, new treasures as well as the old. All right, now Jesus asked the disciples if they understand his teachings. The disciples reply, yes. And then Jesus tells them that they are now to be the new teachers of the law. That they are to teach now the things of Jesus, that this new old and new thing, right? They are to teach this to other people. Jesus is saying that you have to raise other disciples. That discipleship, one of the greatest marks of discipleship is this. You have disciples. You actually have disciples. Meaning that you actually have a heart to disciple people. Because you know what? It's very difficult for somebody to know the ways of Jesus unless somebody helps them along the way. Right? It's very hard for people to just, to, just, just to go. And some of you know how hard that is because nobody's ever invested in you. Nobody's ever said, why don't you come along and I'm going to help you to grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. You know how hard that is. And then some of you, you actually have had discipleship. Somebody's actually discipled you. Are you discipling other people? Discipleship is not an option. It's a command. It's a command. It's a non-negotiable Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the Great Commission, Metro. It's not the Great Suggestion. Jesus is saying, if you believe in me, you are all teachers of the law, every single one of us. So it's not about you just saying I'm going to be a good disciple, but it's now saying, God, will you give me a heart to disciple other people? And discipleship, you know what discipleship is? See, a lot of times you make it way too much about you. It should never be about you. Some of us will say, well, I don't know too much Bible. Like, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I struggle all the time. It's not about you. It's you believing that when two or more are gathered in the name of Jesus, God will be there. And God could use you to encourage people, to disciple them in a way. What discipleship really is, is about an invitation to have somebody be a part of your life. It needs to be life on life so they learn how to live for Jesus by watching how you live your life more than what you say. Now, we've made a big mistake in the church, I think, is because we've made discipleship to be more academic and we're filled with classes. It's more than that. Discipleship is life on life. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Here's what he says. He says, I follow, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. He tells the people in which he's discipling, he says, if you want to grow and be more like Jesus, just watch how I live. Watch how I follow. Why do you think Jesus lived with the disciples for three years? He did that because he wanted them to see how he lived his life. They knew how he lived his life because in the beginning of Mark, what happens? People were trying to find him. And who knew where he was? The disciples. They're like, oh, yeah, Jesus always prays at this time. We'll be back. We'll go get him. And they go and they find him. And, he's, of course, he's praying. Follow me as I follow Christ. So discipleship or mentoring, let's, that's a better word to use today maybe. Mentorship is really about you inviting other people to be a part of your life and allowing them to watch how you live your life. That's what discipleship is. That's what mentoring is. And when you choose Jesus as your king, you naturally begin to have a heart for this. And what I love about this is when I see people who disciple, God will put people in your heart. Or people will come to you and say, will you disciple me? It's really interesting, isn't it? I don't want to embarrass this person. And she really was, I mean, she gave me the green light. But she didn't really want me to mention her. Angie Bay is uh, somebody in our church. I'm going to embarrass her. I, don't care. I hope she's here. I don't know if she's here. But Angie Bay is somebody who I've gotten to know very well. We meet up every month for mentoring and things like that. She currently oversees Zamela USA. And uh, her leader, without her leadership, Zamela USA would not be able to be where it's at today. She is a fantastic leader. But as we meet every month, there's always like dialogue. And she's talking about life and about God and different things. Like God would sometimes put people in her heart. God would just lay some people in her heart. And she'll just naturally reach out. Say, hey, you know what? God's laid me on your heart, on my heart. So I want to just say hello. 
It's interesting. Sometimes people will call her and say, Angie, would you, would you mind mentoring me? And recently I know that somebody, God put somebody in her heart and said, you know, and, and we talked about it. She said, Peter, like, God's been putting this person in my heart. But doesn't it sound a little presumptuous, presumptuous that I go to them and say, hey, you want me to disciple you or mentor you? I was like, no. That's what discipleship is. And she just naturally, and I never talked to her about, like, you should be doing this because you're a follower of Jesus. But what happens is that when you see Jesus as your king, and when you see how God has impacted and transformed your life, why, don't you, why wouldn't you want to help other people to encounter that? And so she naturally calls out and reaches out to women and says, hey, you want, you want to meet up? She's never gotten a no. And she disciples. It's so organic. And it's not like, okay, let's sit down, let's talk about, you know, predestination, let's talk about theology one-on-one. It's about how do we find God in the doldrums of life? How do we find God in the natural journey and the pilgrimage that God brings us to on a daily basis? The one thing, though, that you do need to know that Jesus makes it very clear in this passage is that when we choose to do a life where we disciple other people is that we have to be people of the word. Listen, if you're not a person of the word of God, you will begin to believe that the things of this world is the authority in which you are to live by. It happens all the time. And that's why when you believe Jesus is your king, when Jesus says, hey, do you understand this? He's asking a very critical question to the disciples. He's saying, do you understand this? Do you realize what this means? And they said, yes. And then he says, well, now you are to teach these things to other people. We have to know the word of God in such a way, not so that we can teach it. You have to know it so that you can apply the truths that you learn in the word of God and so that you can live under the power of that truth and it allows you to get deeper, intimate more with God. It allows you to forge a deeper more, deeper, more intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And what that does naturally is then it gives you a greater heart to want to impact other people's lives. And God will use you to transform people's lives. One of the greatest things you and I can experience today is really allowing God to use your life to impact other people's lives. It's how God's wired us and built us now. And so the challenge today is, will you choose to make disciples or not? Because if you say, if you, like, I can't make disciples, you've already said no. You won't fully know what it means to submit yourself to the kingship of Jesus because Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. It's a commandment. It's not a suggestion that he makes for you and me. So get to know the word. Devote yourself to it, all right? One of the things that we offer as a church, I mean, you can do it by yourself, but I don't encourage you to do it by yourself. I think that should be a one facet of how you get connected to the word of God. You should be reading it on your own, but you should be reading it in a group of, with a group of people. It's the best way for you to study scripture, all right? I want to encourage you to do that by joining a small group. Small groups registration will be happening in a few weeks. Sign up for it. Be a part of a small group because you'll always look at a text and you'll read it together, all right? There are other ways in how you can do that at this church that we offer you so that you can read the Bible in a group as opposed to just yourself. All right? The one thing is through public reading of scripture. Thursdays at 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. on Zoom, you can read one hour of the Bible. And Pastor Clay leads it. It's really cool because he always gives you some really great background to the text that you're going to listen to. And you listen to the word together. So at work, many of you are working from home now. Take your lunch at 11.30. Sign up for it. If you check it off today on the comp card, we'll get you the link this week so you can do it on t Thursday. And then eat. You can get your food and listen to the word of God in community. It's beautiful. All right? One of my favorite things I love to do is Friday mornings at 6 a.m. We have Friday morning prayer meetings yeah. on Zoom. Yeah. On Zoom. All right? And it's only for one hour, but we got people from all over the world joining us. We have a guy in Guatemala, Pastor Josue. Josue, I know you're watching, but he joins us. <laughs> Josue gets up. You know how early he gets? It's two hours earlier. So he's getting up at 3 a.m. to make it to this thing. It's early. We got Bruce and Judy, and I know they're watching. They join us from Pennsylvania. We got people from all over, and there are people in our community. We get together. We'll spend 30 to 40 minutes studying the text for the Sunday. And I love it because you guys ask the best questions. We interact with the text. We're asking questions. We're struggling with it. And then we have a rabbi that joins us every week, Pastor David Hosang. I mean, you guys don't understand how amazing this is. Like, it's so great. And he's just giving us, like, meat to eat, like ribeye steaks, like medium rare. 
aged for 21 days. I mean, he's just given us stuff, and we're taking it in as a group. We're learning and learning because that's how the Bible was supposed to be read and studied together. You could be a part of that. Yeah. Sign up for that. Take advantage. Don't read the Bible just by yourself, but get into it in community, and it'll be a beautiful thing. Will you make disciples or not? That's the choice you have to make. Will you choose to make disciples or not? Because how you answer that question will be a reflection if you see God as your king, Jesus as your king, or just a helper. Jesus is so much more than a helper. He's your king. Amen. And I do hope that you will understand the power of that and you really live under the power of that truth is when you can begin to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite uh, preachers and uh, a man that's made a real big impact in my life is uh, a pastor, an Italian pastor. His name is Tony Campolo. How many of you know who Tony Campolo is? Wow, okay. <laughs> Just one, two people. Campolo is one of my favorites. And, uh, you know, he spoke at Fuller a couple times, and I've read a bunch of his books. Uh, my passion for social justice and understanding uh, God uh, being with the least, the last, and the lost really comes from this man. And uh, I've learned a great deal from him, and, uh, and he's been a true blessing in my life. Uh, Tony shares a story. Uh, you know, he, he's in, he, he went to a church in Philadelphia. Uh, that's where he's from. And he said that at a time when there was gentrification, what ended up happening was a lot of white people left the city and they moved into the suburbs. And a lot of the black and brown people started moving into the city, unfortunately. And so as a result of that, uh, he said like he decided that he and his family were still gonna stay in Philadelphia and they were gonna still attend a church in Philadelphia. And they ended up being a part of a black church for many, 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 many years. And he, would, and he would share so many stories about like what it's like to be a part of a black church as a white Italian man, right? And he would go there, he'd preach at times and different things like that. But he said the fa his favorite time of the year was they would do this one thing on a Saturday evening and it would be Student Recognition Day. Student Recognition Day. And he said that, you know, the place would be packed with like 500 older black grandmothers and grandfathers. The place would be hot because it'd be in the summer. They'd get the fans and, and try to cool themselves down, right? And he said these students would start to come up, and what will happen is that they'll start to come up. And what I love about black churches is that when, 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 they, when, when you say something and it agrees with their spirit, what do they usually do? They'll say something. They respond. There's a response. And Tony says, like, you know, a student will come up and say, hello, my name is Jared, and I'm studying literature at UPenn. And then all of a sudden, he said, you'll just see the whole entire congregation, these black grandmothers and grandfathers, will just start breaking out and saying, like, well, <laughs> praise you, God. Amen, 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 right? Another person would come up and say, hey, my name is Jennifer. I'm studying pre-law at Harvard. And they would just start going. They'll start getting more excited about it and say, praise you, Jesus. They'll start yelling, clapping, getting up. Tony says that if you think you've heard good music, he says you've never really heard good music until you've heard 500 grandmothers and grandfathers moaning and groaning the joys because their grandchild is becoming something America never wanted them to become, if you know what I mean, yeah. Yeah. right? Afterwards, these kids will share their thing. They'll all sit down. The place is like on fire. Then the pastor comes up, and he looks at these kids that are sitting in the front, and he'll just say, children, children, you're going to die. You're going to die. It's good to tell young kids they're going to die, right? Because they never think they're going to die. Nobody young thinks they're going to die. Only old people think about that. So he says, you're going to die. Because one day you're going to die. They're going to take your body. They're going to throw it in a hole, pour dirt in your face. And then everyone's going to go back to church and eat potato salad. <laughs> that's what he said, right? He said, you know what? He said, that's not the point. He said, when you were born, you were the only one crying but everyone around you was smiling. They were full of joy. He said, but that's not the real point. He said, the real point is that when you die, are you the one that's only gonna be the one smiling? Will there be anyone standing in your grave site? Will they be crying? Being sad that you've gone from this world? He said, it really depends upon what you're living for. It all depends on what you're living for. He says, right now, you're studying for all these degrees? You're studying for the bachelor degree, the, the master degrees, the doctorate degrees. Is that what it's about? It's life about living for the titles or is it about living for the testimonies? 
See, that's great black preaching, right? I mean, it's got like alliteration to it, you know? Like, black preaching is just a different level of preaching, right? I love that kind of preaching. Like, I was at a black church this Friday, and I just love preaching at a black church because when they agree with something, they just respond. They always respond. They just agree, and like, black preachers are like the best. Even if you can't preach, people will respond to the congregation. They'll say, help them, Jesus. Help them, Jesus. Help them, Jesus. Right? They're always respond. So I just love the black church. And black preachers are a different level of preaching. And this pastor got up there and he did something only black preachers could do. You know what he did? He went through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelations in 10 minutes. <laughs> only black preachers can do that. Right? He says, you got Pharaoh. Ooh, that's a great title. Pharaoh. Ruler of Egypt. He tried to kill the people of God. But when it was all over, all Pharaoh had was the title. But Moses had the testimonies. That's good, isn't it? That's really good, isn't it? Right? He, and he keeps going on. He goes, you got Jezebel. Oh, Queen Jezebel. That's a great title, Queen. You got Elijah. She tried to kill Elijah the prophet, but when it was all over, all Jezebel had was a title, but Elijah had the testimony. It's getting to you, isn't it? testimonies. Why don't you give it a shot? You try it, all right? He goes, you got Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. Ooh, King of Babylon. It's a great title. He tried to kill Daniel, the prophet, with the, uh, by sending him in a lion's den, but when it was all over, all Nebuchadnezzar had was the title, but Daniel had the testimony. Exactly. <laughs> I don't got any more for you. I say all I got. That's all I got. It's as simple as that. One day, you're all going to die. They're going to put your body in a hole, throw dirt on your face, and everyone's going to go back to church and eat potato salad. What's it all going to mean for you in the end? Are you just going to have a tombstone with all the titles you've accomplished in this life written on it? Or are there actually going to be people standing around your gravesite sharing testimonies of how you've impacted their lives? of how you were able to take their hopeless state of life and you were able to infuse the hope of Jesus in them, of how you were able to take their sorrow and God used you to allow them to encounter true joy in life. Isn't that what you really want? I mean, titles are nice, but testimonies is what God has called you and I to live for today. And so today, your choice is this. Will you choose to make disciples or not? Because Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've commanded you to do. And when you do that, he says, I will always be with you to the very end Amen. of the age. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. May Jesus be your king, not your helper. And when he becomes your king, may you submit to him by discipling his people. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. So that's a choice you have to make today. First, will you choose Jesus to be your king? Because if you say no to that, he's just your helper. And that Jesus can't do much for you because you're the king and he's your helper. But if you make that choice that he would be your king, then this, you're able to make the second choice. Will you choose to make disciples? You're going to say, you know what, God, I pray that you would place people in my heart or people would call me and reach out to me and I will begin the process of letting people watch how I live my life for you. I'll invite them into my life, and as a result, that they will begin to be a disciple. God is not wanting you to do this when you feel like you're ready or you're perfect, but he wants you to start now, because everyone is on a different spiritual plane and a different pilgrimage, and God will use you. Maybe God will place somebody in your heart today. So will you choose Jesus as your king, and will you choose to make disciples? Let's make that choice. We'll go to him, and then I'll close us in prayer. Lord, help us to choose you as our king. 
And I think sometimes we've done a real disservice to people that attend church, that are part of the church. We've only really just taught that you're a God who helps. There's so much more than that. You're our king. And so, Lord, I pray for those who've chosen you as their king, God, that you would just bless their decision today. And, God, that you would put them on a trajectory, God, that they would begin to encounter the power of what it means to live under the power of your truth. God, that it would lead them to a deeper level of intimacy with you, where there would be healing of deep wounds, where, God, that there would be releasing of shame. And, God, there would be a vision that they would begin to see what their life can be because you are a part of it. Knowing, God, that it's only in our weaknesses can your strength be perfected in us. So as we choose you as our king, we submit ourselves to you in a weak state so that your grace can be perfected in us. And I pray for those who've made the choice that they're going to say, you know what? I'm going to disciple people. I'm going to mentor people. And so, God, if anyone has prayed that prayer, Lord, I pray that even this week you'll begin to bring people into their hearts. They will begin to get excited about those people. They'd pray for them. Or maybe somebody would call them up and say, hey, will you, will you mentor me? Will you disciple me? I pray that we'd make that decision to disciple. And God, that we wouldn't just be selfish about this relationship we have with you, but that we'd be willing to share with other people. And so as we do that, Lord, may we live under the power and the truth of the Great Commission that as we make disciples of all nations, as we teach them to do everything that you've taught us to obey, may we know the power of what it means to know that you will be with us to the very end of the age, that your presence is heaven to us. So thank you, God, for this time. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. 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 There's a communication card. If you can just flip that over or, or on, your, on your app. There are some next steps that I really do want you to take. And if you check these off, we'll get back to you. We promise, all right? The first one, if we can just put it up. I'm committing my life to Jesus for the very first time. If you've committed your life to Jesus and you, you, or you want to get to that place, just check it off. And I promise you, we will reach out to you. And you can't do this by yourself. Please know that. If you check off yes and you've never said yes to Jesus, we'll get back to you. And we hope that you would welcome us coming, joining alongside of you to help you to grow in your walk with the Lord. Second one, I will share an area of my life where I struggle to obey God and receive accountability for it. We all have areas where we struggle with God. I have areas where I struggle to obey God. Some people should be a part of, of your journey to help you to get there so you can begin to obey God in those areas. So why don't you share that? Third one, Please register me to attend Metro's Friday morning prayer meeting virtually every week at 6 a.m. So hopefully if you check that off on the app, you're eventually going to get something from Planning Center and you're going to have to register. When you do that, I'll get it. I'll let you in the group and you'll be getting an email on Thursday, I promise you, with the text and the email link. All right? So if you want to join us this, this Friday, please just check that off and you'll get something and you just have to fill it out and then I'll... You know, I'll get the email and I'll, I'll okay you and you'll be a part of our group, all right? The fourth one, please register me to attend Audio Bible Club virtually every Thursday at 1130. If you check that off, we'll send you a Zoom link. Clay will send you, Pastor Clay will send you a Zoom link, all right, to that and you can be a part of Scripture and listen to it for an hour. Fifth, I would like more information about becoming a mentor for the women's ministry. Some of you ladies, it's time that you take the step, all right? Now listen, you're gonna have to go through a process, you're gonna meet with Pastor Shirley, it's just because you say you wanna do it, doesn't mean that we're gonna say yes, but you know, we have to make sure we get to know you a little bit if we don't know you. So just embrace the process, know the process is holy, all right? So be a part of that. So if you're interested, we'd love for you to sign up for that. And I think we have one more, do we? Yes. Please send me uh, information on how I can serve the Englewood community in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. Listen, uh, yesterday we had a bunch of you, thank you, I think about 10 of you went to a person's house in Englewood. They lost everything. Here's the thing. They couldn't even clean up their basement. It was flooded, and it was still flooded. And 10 of you went, and you cleaned their house for them. Could you imagine just the moles and stuff? Englewood needs help. If you're interested, check that off. And Janet, uh, our staff member, will get back to you on how you can help. 